Uh, this is a unique opportunity to converse with leading Melville experts from the Melville Society who are joining us from across the country, as I'm sure many of you are, to talk all things Moby Dick. Uh, I know I've got my copy out. I hope everyone else has been <laughs> enjoying listening to um, the marathon, and uh, I look forward to sitting in the background here and letting the scholars take it away. I just say welcome everybody. It's good to see you, Jim, Andrew, uh, Emily, Karen, Gail, Nancy, Susan, Jim, Chad, Jeff. Great to see you. Um, we wish we could be in the gallery at the museum in a big circle and chairs, but we're stuck with the Zoom gallery. But it's still nice <laughs> to see everybody's faces in the squares instead of the circle. Uh, um, this is an opportunity to just explore any questions or inquiries or problems or engagements or inspirations that you have when you uh, look at Melville's text. And it's a book that uh, raises questions, continues to raise questions. And uh, uh, the, us, us uh, members of the um, Melville Society Cultural Project will just explore and chew on these issues with you together. So the, uh, the floor is open. You can uh, uh, take off your mute and ask a question. You can also use the chat function on the bottom. And uh, we look forward to spending an hour uh, engaging Moby Dick uh, and getting getting eaten up by the book together. I'll uh, start off with a question, I guess. Might as well. Good. Absolutely, like everybody here, been intoxicated with uh, Moby Dick. Uh, I'm a retired uh, merchant mariner. Uh, oil tanker captain and the oil tankers are the successor of the old whaling ships mm -hmm. and uh, um, for reading Moby Dick all of the, the the chapters involving this sort of quasi science about uh, um, the whales juxtaposed to the uh, this wonderful narrative that's in the novel uh, I just have never really quite grasped why it's filled with all of this stuff about whales that eh, it's kind of hard to read and <clears throat> probably not very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that, he probably felt that whales were going to last longer than oil ships would. Yeah. They were here for a long time. Hmm. Hopefully they will outlast the <laughs> oil takers. <laughs> I think that should be our goal. <laughs> what is the effect of of all that all that ballast uh, uh, with Melville's language, him um, grounding it in the material material aspects of whaling? Uh, 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 Jim, you said that that makes it difficult difficult to read. Uh, uh, why do you, why do you all think uh, that? Melville grounds that it's a definite contrast to his the biggest book he wrote before this called Marty, which did not have that material grounding. It was much more abstract uh, and ideal uh, in its philosophy. Mm. Hey Jeff, one way of looking at that question, I think, would be to just I think to recognize that Melville maybe has like a bone to pick with science in general, uh, because 19th century science was I think becoming um, sort of overpowering in its potential and possibility. And in the chapter Brit, uh, chapter 58, he refers to sciences that that however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much in flattering future. And then he goes on to say that the ocean will continually pulverize us anyway. Um, I think that, that in many of the scientific chapters or, you know, cetology anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of, of exploring what science can do, but also a sense of, of almost like mocking what science is, is touted as being capable of. So it's a, I think it's a really complicated message about science. Mm -hmm. I sort of think he's, he came back from these whaling ship voyages, and I'm sure he was a pretty interesting character at a cocktail party. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure they had some kind of version of a cocktail party. So maybe he's just trying to 
you know, impress people with, uh, you know, who really probably had no knowledge of uh, whales at all. But it's still the way it's written. It's very hard to follow what he's trying to say in those chapters. We sometimes lose students when we come to the symbology chapter because it is just so different. You have to <clears throat> spend the story and and read that and put it aside and try to figure in the end what it all adds up to. But it's a very unusual way of telling a story. Yeah, I, when, I, when I teach Moby Dick, I always like try to address the cytology chapter right off. And I um, say, OK, this is the single most maligned chapter in the book. And uh, people are always on. And then I'd like to start out by showing that it has, you know, different things like one element of it is that it's even cytology, the most malign chapters like riddled with humor. I love the way he um, yeah. divides the whales by size of books. When I was first read Moby Dick, I just thought folio and octavo were, were words I didn't know. They were scientific words I didn't know because I didn't know anything about the printing of books. <laughs> and then when I found out what he was doing with that, that I thought that was hilarious. And it's also kind of uh, you know, he weights down that chapter with by citing so many sources to give you a sense, you know, of the importance of whales. But then he 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 critiques, like uh, Jeff said, he crit critiques science in there. He he makes fun of Linnaeus, but he also uh, critiques um, the Bible and he and he critiques um, folk knowledge with you know Charlie Coffin and Simeon Macy, two old messmates of mine. So I feel like he's sort of crit critiquing every major form of knowledge, science, biblical, and folk, and making us question all of those. Um, and, in, and, and in the midst of it, he's giving us a lot of just basic information about whales. So I try to, you know, kind of show all those things. And then I love the ending of it too, where he goes off into that metaphysical lift. Uh, you know, this is but the draft of a draft, all time, strength, passion, patience, all the things that he doesn't have enough of and all the things that my undergraduates don't have enough of and that I don't have enough of and certainly my husband doesn't have enough of, you know, so, you know, so I feel like he's doing all that even in that chapter that's so hard to get around. I love that point that God keep me from ever completing anything, this idea that science is this attempt to harness knowledge and relay it in these kind of systematized classifications, but that in representing these different ways of reckoning with whales, he underscores the kind of abundance and infiniteness and incompleteness of that project, right? So that um, the rationality and objectivity of someone like Linnaeus is proven to be totally fallible and impossible. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. And in that sense, he's also diddling uh, landlubbers in, in some way, skylarking as a sailor would. Um, when I was listening to Sam Waterston, you always catch something new, even in the first chapter, when he said that uh, I'm something of a salt, Ishmael said. Uh, and that, salty, that saltiness is, is clearly there. And uh, I think uh, people in Melville's time did not have videos of whales, could not sort of access uh, uh, their visuality the way we can. So he could play uh, uh, fast and loose with the um, with the portentousness of the image of the of the whale's mystery, uh, also with the um, the technical aspects of sailing, which would make make him seem like an insider and give him authority over those who were uh, had pokers before the fire instead of harpoons in their hands. Mm -hmm. Could I just add that I, I, I think um, Melville read a wide range of whaling literature and in and, and, and literature more generally. So we've, we've already had a reference to the Bible. Uh, he had been reading a lot of Shakespeare and was very moved by Shakespeare, but he, you know, he, he read um, Owen Chase's, um, or knew, knew, knew Owen Chase's uh, Story of the whale ship Essex, uh, which got incorporated in the in 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 the, the whales ramming of the Pequod, um, and uh, he had to do something with all this um, uh, whaling lore that he had been reading and, and reading about. I mean, just looking at the extracts again, we can see another 
um, source of a wide range of reading that, that he engaged in, 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 in preparation for writing this. So the, the book is a kind of, um, a, a kind of collection, which sometimes called a vadimakum of, of, of all kinds of um, uh, different forms of writing, um, literary, scientific, mythological, and I think you know he had the kind of memory that just remembered virtually everything he read, and he needed to do something with all this. Um, and, and, and so some of it gets incorporated in the uh, in the cytology chapter, and some gets incorporated in the in the in the uh, various chapters that deal with uh, parts of the whale, the battering ram, the blanket, the tail, um, and uh, I, you know, I think I, I think that that this is also a way of um, what one of my favorite themes is the epic character of this book, and I think this is another way that he can build up the subject of whales as a um, as a as as a series of uh, species, and 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 give us a sense of the the range and the size and the kind of. Uh, almost overwhelming amount of um, variation among 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 the whale the whale species. I think the one thing that's very serious about the cytology chapter is that many of these scientists in their snug retreats have never seen a living whale. They're they're dealing with specimens that have been sent by ships that they study and they. Uh, put them in different parts of the world and all that. And they've never seen a living whale and it's called to the monstrous pictures of whales with the best known paintings of whales are by painters who've never seen whales. So uh, he is attacking the, the elites who are, have become the authorities in all these issues without having firsthand experience. And I, I think that is a, a, a very strong uh, emphasis through the whole novel. And, and, and I, I think it's really, healthy uh, in the Victorian age as uh, these masses of materials by experts have been building up. But if they don't have firsthand knowledge, he's saying, what are they really able to show us? Ron? Uh, building on Chris's point, it, it does seem like part of Melville's project is exposing or exploring just the limitations of text. And we have that set up early in extracts and that may be a different type of imagining and less scientific, but even when we get to cytology, something that purports to be a little more solid is sort of um, bleeding into other categories. And to use publishing to frame that seems like another level of irony. And it just seems like the, the inadequacy of texts is, is there throughout the novel. But also this idea uh, of the ineffable, that, that motif has always intrigued me about the novel and just trying to find a language, uh, whether it's scientific or aesthetic, um, is certainly flowing through this, this novel. Barbara? Um, I remember uh, Mary was mentioning she thought it was, cytology was actually funny. And I remember one time, I don't know if I'm talking out of turn, but Peter Whittemore, who's like a direct descendant of Melville, used to always come to these, um, these readings. And he said to me one time that he, the Melville family had chosen to read cytology and they went out to dinner and they all got really tipsy. And then they came back and read the, those chapters. And, you know, I kind of looked at it in an entirely different way after it kind of looking for the funniness in it. Well, especially when you hear it read out loud and you can imagine it. And I mean, I had a question for, for Jim is, is there, I think there must be an equivalent in your experience as a captain that, that there's a whole lot of knowledge, specialized knowledge that you have that other people might find forbidding, but that is very familiar to you and that you could joke about or, or talk about endlessly. Um, I mean, what's what's the equivalent in your experience? Well, I keep getting, you know, whenever I get with people, they always ask about oil spills. And of course, we oh yeah, on the um, on ship uh, as a tanker captain, we that's a constant joke. It's about whoop, 
you know, <laughs> oil spills. Now, I haven't had an oil spill, but we joke about it a lot. But, yeah. You know. Well, that sort of gallows humor or, or operating room humor is is operating there too, right? That, that yeah. uh, these are these are hot button topics um, that but, uh, that lands people don't understand. But I'll tell you, I, I think I have a unique perspective in Mopey Dick as I read this and it's obvious that Melville was a real mariner. There's no question that he's right. really experienced. And so many of the, of the nuances about a mariner's life then are applicable today. I mean, we have slot chests on a ship. Crews will, after a long voyage, will pile off and they'll go right back onto another ship all over again because they they or their families have spent all the money or they have no other, that's their life. And they just roll right on onto another ship. The thing, it real life as a mariner hasn't changed that much. We have a question from or a comment from Chad. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I mean, some of the comments have touched on a theme already just to make it a little bit more explicit, but that's kind of this, idea of a, of a totalizing influence, right? And whether it's, you know, in other words, leaning on any sort of authority at all, right? So the, the idea that science can just give you the answers is part of the criticism that's there. And, and whether it's science or, you know, the, the, um, you know, the whalemen themselves or whatever it is, um, there, there's no escaping the fact that you really have to come to your own conclusions at some point. Tell me and, when I'm done with three things. And you know, even when you start to look at Ahab's problem, right? Ahab is essentially, he's trying to totalize the universe in a way, right? He wants a perfection. He wants, he wants a lack of vulnerability in the world, a, a lack of any sort of negativity to it. Um, and if he could just sort of let go and you know, accept his own vulnerability, it essentially resolves resolves the plot that way, right? Andrew, uh, yep. Yeah, I uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Great. Uh, anyway, I, I hello from Scotland. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here. Uh, I've got a, 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 a kind of question comment on the the reading of the text. Uh, because I've been kind of mulling in this court recently, and I, I, I kind of feel that it's possibly one of the, the earliest really modernist novels, um, you, know, you know, 70 years before, before Ulysses, which pales Ulysses into insignificance largely. <laughs> um, and, uh, but should, should, one, should one read it as a modernist novel? Should one read it as, as a grand epic in the way that one would read, you know, Eliot's, Eliot's Four Quartets? Does one read it as a uh, as a as a piece of phenomenological philosophy, uh, or does one read it as a boy's own adventure, um, or should one read it at excuse my dog coming in there, uh, or should one read it with all of those in mind? I was going to say all of yes. the above. Yes, all of the above. Keep going. <laughs> you you uh, right on. <laughs> yeah, I mean there are uh, there are there are passages that no matter how 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 often how often I read it, uh, you come across uh, you you turn the page and there's the most blindingly brilliant paragraph about something whether it's in cytology or whether it's, or whether it's in the Grand Armada or whatever, um, and it always it always takes your breath away, um, uh, and and I, I and I feel reading it almost almost as a as a grand piece of epic poetry. Uh, is possibly for me the most rewarding way of doing it. It's our Ulysses, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah. Can you say more about the, the modernist text, the modernist dimension of the text that you're seeing and thinking about? I d well, we've, I, all, we've all assented to this idea already. So, but it, yes, exactly. Nice well, well, it, I, it just seems it just seems so experimental uh, when you think that it was being written in 1850. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've got 
you've got uh, you know the straight the straight narrative you've got the straight dialogues you've got you've got you've got theater scenes in the middle of it you've got you've, you've got hymns in the middle of it you've got you've got you've got all sorts of things which which are rolled together uh, and it becomes uh, a kind of a, a kind of patchwork quilt uh, to you know refer back to you know last night's talk about the counterpane that yeah. that that you that you read a paragraph and uh, a chapter like like the counterpane you think yeah that's fine and, and then you look into it in a, in a little bit more close close reading um and you know almost almost every sentence opens up all sorts of wonderful worlds of of you know exploration which are just really rewarding um more than uh, you know largely any other book that i've ever come across mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, for me, the, the, the term that, that um, almost spoke the whole answer to the question is experimental. Uh, and I think mm. it is a very experimental work. Um, I mean, even to the series of relatively short chapters throughout this book, I mean, 135 short chapters. There are some longer ones, mm. um, the town host story, and uh, cytology, and whiteness of the whale, but a lot of them are a page page and a half. I mean, they, they almost look like um, paintings. Um, you know, they're, they, they, you, you can take them all in, uh, 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 all, all, you know, with, with one um, kind of close look. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I, I certainly uh, would, uh, endorse the idea of this being an experimental work and for the reasons that you that you um, spoke to that there's yes. drama and poetry and mm -hmm. philosophy and pseudo philosophy and um, uh, science and whatnot all kind of mixed up together um, um, yes yeah, so i've been i i'd be I'd be interested to hear about uh, you know what you know what kind of academic work has been done on assessing it as largely the first you know really modernist novel you know the real the real the real experimental stuff um and uh, and also i think there is there's a bit of work being done on the phenomenological side of it um mm -hmm. which uh I, I mean i i mean i find it amazing to think of of the phenomenology in the early in in the early 20th century um and melville's writing this stuff you know 50 70 years earlier yeah, um, yeah. It's, it, it's it's quite it's quite extraordinary you know how how can he how can he do that is he just completely in the zone so to speak um uh, or or is he or does it or or does he know exactly what he's doing <laughs> what i find interesting about the, the uh, that whole era of uh, 19th century uh, authors you know Haw uh, melville hawthorne dickens uh, Poe, all of these guys sort of came up with a whole new genre of writing. Before, I think before that, in the 18th century, there, there were no grand novels like, like these, hmm. what we're seeing in the 19th century. And well, Tristram was Shandy was pretty experimental. Yeah. Tristram Shandy. Um, uh, um. But, but, but your point suggests also the way the novel hadn't really um, matured or was in the process of maturing by 1850 and was still itself a very experimental genre. Um, and you know, this is something I see with my students that the expectations they bring to novels uh, make them surprised when they read Moby Dick because they're expecting it to behave like the novels they read. And they, they, they wanna call it a novel. And I say, you know, he, he often called his books uh, or his short stories, articles, um, or, or travel narratives. I mean, it's not always clear that he thinks he's writing a novel or that he knows what a novel is. So there's a lot of generic questions here. I think there's, there's I'm thinking right now, just from a biographical point of view that at this point, Melville had a pretty deeply failed novel in Marty. He was in debt to his father-in-law. He'd sort of retreated to the country. <laughs> And at this moment, he creates something that's purely experimental and the courage that that must have taken when he needed to make money, when he needed to uh, try to, you know, resuscitate his career to do something <laughs> like this was just, I don't know, I just love, I love it that he could do that. It's just so um, tremendous to me. 
I think in response to Andrew's question, it, it explains in some ways why the novel didn't discover a broader readership until the 1920s, when uh, some uh, some of these modern modernist notions were more were more normative. And uh, as far as the phenomenological goes, what's amazing about Moby Dick is that, and it has to do with this experimentalism of him being in the flow of creation uh, uh, as he writes, uh, is that uh, whatever Par critical paradigm has evolved. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's a reading of Mel of Moby Dick from from that angle, uh, and none of that could have been imagined because the language of interpretation wasn't there when Melville was making the creation in the first place. And that's part of what makes it a dynamic and living text. That Moby Dick, the uh, the book, is is still swimming like the whale is at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Naomi. Yeah, I'm curious, running along the same thread of kind of um, historicizing Moby Dick within the kind of larger literary canon of, of the period, um, how in terms of current scholarship, Moby Dick sits within, you know, um, similar readings of French literature of the period and the experimentalism of someone like Balzac um, or, you know, Le Mis, um, uh, if it's productive to think of him in comparison to contemporaries working elsewhere, or if that's kind of a a, um, a comparative literature structure that that is uh, less popular these days, I don't really know where where the field sits in that regard. Well, I think most comparisons, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, are are to earlier writing and um make it you know make it clear that Melville is doing something different um I mean uh, and not not just early American writing or earlier European writing but um but but ancient writing um ancient epics um classical classical writings um Dante and um um, Homer and um, uh, you know, you know the, the, um, the 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 broadly the broadly known um, classics of the of the Western world. Um, there are, have been, I, you know, I think um, people who have pointed out similarities to more contemporary work elsewhere, but I think most of the most of the comparisons are with earlier work to try to um, see what makes it different, um, and or to make to to make the point that it is very different and and e experimental. Although I don't think that's always the the term of art that people use. Um, uh, but I think Melville was always mixing genres and mixing um, his readings of, from a wide range of different kinds of sources. Um, you know, he read a lot of whaling voyage uh, narratives, but he read a, just a, a lot of other kinds of narratives as well. Um, Well, I was struck by your invoking Balzac because I've seen work on comparing, you know, comparative work on Melville and Balzac and also uh, Melville and Russian novelists. Um, mm -hmm. Nancy Ruttenberg had wrote a book about that. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think about the way that um, Chris is describing this, the way that that Melville appropriates people like Shakespeare and, and um, uh, the classic authors, and at the same time has such a depth of realistic detail um, and both a philosophical and, and aesthetic interest in his own world uh, that makes him like the, the, the realists of the 19th century. Um, so, you know, he's also been compared to Dickens and um, uh, uh, Bob Wallace is compared to Frederick Douglass <laughs> uh, and um, other contemporaries very productively. So, so um, I think that's a really open line of, I, I'm, I'm not thinking of anything really recent on this, but others may, may have better ideas. Um, but I think it's a persistent um, strand. I found some, some really interesting um, research on connections to Carlisle uh, during the COVID 
I don't know, retreat last year, I sat down with Sarga Rosardis for the first time and it was just incredible. And there's, there, there's a lot of echoing, maybe is a word, um, from that text that, that you, you can hear still in Moby Dick. Um, also a sign of the times, an essay Carlisle wrote. Um, so, and, you know, I, I found a dissertation and a couple of, of academic pieces on, on that connection that's really interesting. And Carlisle, Carlisle is just amazing. I really mm -hmm. love him. So. Mm -hmm. One word that gets my put, put up your hand or, uh, or, or offer a question in the chat and we'll keep exploring. Uh, Bob, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, uh, one word that comes to mind along with the experimental is just simply interdisciplinary. I mean, uh, teaching him to an honors class, which is what I usually do, mix English mixed with honors, he, he speaks to all the different parts of our, our academic disciplines in the 21st century. And he was writing at a time in the Victorian age before they'd separated out in the way they have now. So like the, the main journals that he wrote for in New York and the, the Athenaeum in London were journals of literature, science, and art. The, those three things were part of a common culture. And he grabbed all parts of those uh, before they'd been pulled apart in the way that we have now. So he was a generalist. He hadn't become a specialist and he hadn't gone to college and graduate school where if he had, he might've become an early specialist in this or that. And I think, his ability to explore all areas of knowledge, um, you know, without barriers and having the courage, just the power of mind and interest to explore these things. Um, it's a huge part of his ability to write the way he did. Um, and of course, he'd been to London for six um, weeks before he, he wrote Moby Dick and went to all the galleries and also picked up on what obviously uh, Marx was doing, uh, you know, he, he, he's up on the economic theory and, and as well as the aesthetic latest developments. And I think he just absorbed all of that and made a book where you could get all that in there, which is, you know, that's part of the ex experimentalism that he found a form to express his interest in the holistic nature of human and mammalian experience. And, and there was no model for doing that certainly not as a novel and not in any of the other separate disciplines either, really. It may be relevant too that um, he had no college education uh, and is um, cer cer certainly he was, he was literate as a, you know, as a young, as a, as a young man um, and, um, and, and well-read as people were in, in their, uh, from, upper middle class or middle class families, but um, he, he really is self-taught is self for the most part. Um, and I, I think that might um, account for some of the experimental character or the, the broad range of his interests. Um, um, he did a lot of his reading on the whale ships um, and you know whatever was, whatever was already on the shelves, whatever, the captain or anyone else uh, could uh, or was willing to lend him, um, he seemed to have absorbed uh, what was in those books. Um, Barbara? Mike, Barbara, please. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the painting that was in the lecture last night in the Spouter Inn. Um, I can't remember who the artist was, but didn't it predate when he was writing? Although it looked so much like, oh, that's the painting that, that <laughs> he's talking about. <laughs> well, I'll speak to that. It came after the, the, the book. That's, the yeah. writer painted in 18, what, 1866 or something? So was he actually trying to paint the painting that might have been there? Was Ryder trying to paint that? I don't know that. That's interesting. I don't know how much Ryder knew about Melville. Um, but it has that same ineffable quality that, that uh, the painting has. And 
And Melville's painting was very much like Turner's whaling paintings that were five years earlier that he probably didn't see, but he would have heard a lot about in London. So I think that's another thing he was absorbing, hmm. in this case, maybe through his imagination and conversation. Um, but he had seen late Turner paintings, and, and it's highly abstract for anything in the mid-19th century. Mm -hmm. I think the great, one of the great things about the painting is you have to work to figure it out. It doesn't come with a label like so much of 19th century painting does. You, you know exactly what's being portrayed and what it's trying to say. This is something you have to work through and, and bring all of your imagination and some of your doubts and talk to the neighbors. And, uh, and it's really a beautiful metaphor for how to read this book. I, I think he's really telling us, this is the kind of book I've written. It's gonna come to you in, in this rich and complex way and it, it's up to you to figure it out. I just love all the opposites in the book. It's, uh, there's so many opposites. You have uh, these Quakers running this whaling ship that's like some kind of, sad, you know, decorated out like a cannibal ship or something like that. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the senior people, uh, the enlisted guys on the ship, I guess you'd call them uh, the, the harpooners, there are, uh, none of them are white Anglo-Saxons and the, the white Anglo-Saxons are in the forecastle, <laughs> and the, the Africans, the African-American and the uh, uh, Tongan are, is, uh, they're the harpooners, the Indian, I guess the Indian. The Native American, right. Native American, Indian, yeah. And the juxtapositions of uh, so many opposites, Ishmael, and uh, it's just phenomenal throughout the book. Curious, Jim, I know the international cargo ships are still- It's the same. Yeah, and I, it's like that. I'm curious in your oil tankers, uh, did you have international crew or was it a, a largely American? It, it, quote, American crew. You had to be an yeah. American um, or have a green card. Uh, but typically they were Americans from Ghana, Americans from Vietnam, Americans mm. from Eastern Europe, Americans from... Uh, it, it's a great industry for an mm. immigrant to come in mm. and with a minimal amount of education, but a lot of uh, drive for hard work to succeed. And, um, and it's always been that way. It's always been, that's why, um, who's that uh, great fellow from New Bedford in the uh, 18th century who had a whaling ship, um, the African- Paul Cuffey. Paul Cuffey. Paul Cuffey. <laughs> There's Paul C out of the blue, and he, he it was possible because of this industry, and nothing's really changed. Hondurans, we have a lot of Honduranians and Guatemalans, and, so and it, I, I, that, that's one of the things I love about the book is you know that idea. People have this image of you know pre Civil War um, American history having these incredibly strong racial divides, and you know Melville. <laughs> Melville's second ship, the Louisiana, one of the mates, so one of the officers, not even one of the harpooners, but one of the officers was a person of color. So he he himself had experienced that where people of color would be as officers and, and white men would be serving underneath them, you know, long before the Civil War. So I, you know, I think I think that's one of the interesting things about maritime history, but I also think it's also something Melville does really well in the book too. It resonates, the book very, resonates very well with uh, a modern mariner. They look at this and ships are run, still run the same way. Mm -hmm. do, on your ships, uh, do some of these newly arrived immigrants uh, speak a kind of um, pigeon English? Uh, <laughs> that happened on the boat. What, how, how does that, how does the English, the speaking of English? Um, well, yeah, well, there's all kinds yeah. of accents, without a doubt. Right. The Filipinos, we have a large, many Filipinos that go to sea, and they have a very strong accent. And the, uh, Eastern Europeans, 
the, uh, from interestingly from Africa, they they sound like uh, little English boys. And they, yeah, they come uh, from colonial British colonial. Yeah. yeah. British colonial, yeah. I think you're bringing up a great topic too that I teach at a high school and reading this book, you know, what, you know, right in the beginning, you know, Ishmael says, who ain't a slave? And that just, you know, rings a lot of bells instantly. Mm -hmm. like, and, and the question, you know, for me is for a while has been, you know, to what degree is this book working to be an anti-racist kind of effort? And he, he's not doing it overtly, but there's a lot of behind the scenes sort of things about dealing with race and taking on, um, you know, various issues of equality and, and, and yeah, you compare and, him and Mark Twain, what a difference on <laughs> how they deal with race. Ooh. <laughs> yep. Naomi, you had a question? Well, I don't want to derail this interesting avenue, but I was thinking about the ways in which this conversation about the kind of multiculturalism of the ship um, ties back to something that Bob mentioned about thinking about um, Melville's time in London as being a moment when he becomes really clued into the kind of economic conversations that are happening. And not being a Melville scholar like you, I had never really situated this as kind of maybe a product of 1848, which is a really interesting thing to think about. Um, so coming to that cold, I'm, I'm curious um, how that gets explored in the novel, certainly because also ships, of course, are, um, they may be multicultural, but they're highly stratified in terms of order and organization. So it seems on the one hand, almost, you know, a study of class and classlessness or, or combinations of people from different realms, but at the same time, they're so regimented in their positions. So just curious about how that's read. Mm. I mean, this manifesto published in 1848. Yeah. yeah and I was also, of course, the, the um, international revolutions at the same revolutions. time as a backdrop. Yeah. Throughout Europe. Any thoughts on that, Jennifer? No. <laughs> uh, Larry Reynolds wrote a book about um, Melville and Revolution and um, uh, Dennis Berthold talks about uh, the um, uh, revolutions in Italy in the 1840s and their influence on Melville. Uh, and I think Billy Budd's been read in the context of English Revolution um, and French Revolution both. Uh, so I think it's a huge theme. And, and what you're saying about class is so important because it's such an um, uh, important um, uh, cousin to race. Uh, um, Jeff's talking about the book as anti-racist, but um, when we talk about race, we sometimes miss the, the nuances of class. Um, and the hierarchy of the ship is so important uh, as a framework. So um, in, um, uh, I guess it's White Jacket, he has a character say that, oh, whaling ships, they're, they're so, they're like a, they're like a shire town. Um, everything's, you know, everybody's, it's kind of democratic. I mean, it's not, but, but that's what he claims. Um, Whereas the, the, the military ship or the, um, like in Billy Budd or, or White Jacket is a, is a much more hierarchical structure. So he seems to use ships as, as analogies for class structures. Uh, and in Moby Dick seems to um, maybe be avoiding some of those um, very rigid structures, but he comes back to them later in, in Billy Budd. It's, it's not something he, he's very consistent about, it seems to me. He tries a lot of different um, versions of what you're talking about. I would say that Benito Serino also yeah, is yeah. a text you could read in relation to, it's kind of layered with different revolutions, uh, the American, mm. the French, but also the Haitian, Haitian. Haitian. Uh, which, which is key. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the ship is the San Dominic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which seems reminiscent of San Domingue, the French name. Uh, for Haiti. And so I, to me, when Melville's talking about revolution, he's often thinking about uh, the irony that people were still enslaved in the so-called era or age of revolutions in the late uh, 18th century, and also again in the mid 19th century. But also this idea that each revolution contains within it the seeds of its own reversal. 
as well, um, that, that progress can be undone. I think that, uh, as Wynn said, that, uh, you know, uh, class is a cousin to race, and so is um, mutiny a cousin to revolution. And I think that Moby Dick is haunted by the mutiny that does not take place and that uh, Starbuck does not lead against mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the biggest thing that doesn't happen in the book. And uh, I think, so the whole question of a revolution to overthrow uh, authority is really, in, in a way, at, at the heart of the action that, unfortunately, Starbuck can't, or let's say, not blame it just on him, but the whole crew, Ahab happens to be with the crew that can't stand up for itself against his improper leadership. And so that kind of does connect with 48 and, and the whole revolutionary period in that way when it doesn't happen. But with that, um, the idea of the, a possible revolution uh, against Ahab, to me, I thought the crew was sort of enthralled with Ahab and Ahab's leadership was just, um, incredible. He could take these crew who were going to sea to make money. Then the way they made money was to kill whales. And they were not killing whales. They were looking for this one white whale. And I just think that's a phenomenal example of um, the intoxicating leadership of Ahab. They were mesmerized by him. Yeah, exactly. they were definitely. Yeah. It can happen. Yeah, where I work at Mystic Seaport, there's a leadership group that does, um, you know, leadership programs for for um, for different companies and industries. They come and they do a, they do a leadership team building project there, and they center it around Moby Dick, and they use Ahab as the example of a great leader. I always want to say to them. Did, did, did you actually finish the book? But um, it's it's really oh interesting God. to me uh, and how they, they consult it. you because <laughs> yeah. he because of that mesmerizing quality that Ahab has. Can I bring up a question at this point that I've been thinking about? So do you do you all think that Ahab is a machine? I mean, the, this the idea of machinery and like the the crew or cogs in a machine. Um, Ahab in the quarter deck is referred to as having the wheels of vitality spinning in him. He, he tells, he insults Stubb sort of under his breath by saying that Stubb is mechanical. And he even, he even like insults God by saying that all your creativeness is mechanical. But it seems like Ahab himself set on these iron rails of destiny is, you know, machinery. I, I'm, I've just been trying to puzzle through how something could apply to Ahab, but Ahab could also use as an insult to others. But maybe the problem is he's a machine that, you know. He said at one point, bring me, or create for me a man with- Yeah, the complete man. The carpenter. A complete man, but you know, has 50, um, I don't know, 50 meters of brains in, in his, in, and, um, and, no heart. and no heart. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and in that letter to Hawthorne, he says that men distrust God because they fancy him all brain, like a watch, you know, with no right, heart. Right, right. I don't know. I, this this whole machinery thing has been mm -hmm. you know, whirling around in my head. I'm trying to make make it make sense, and it isn't yet. So, any thoughts on Ahab being a machine would be cool. When you've talked about that with the Promethean, with the, the creation of yeah. the Prometheus, it's something I've seen elsewhere too. That um, not not only machine but cyborg that that um, Ahab begins to replace the parts of his body with with prosthetic oh, yeah. prosthetic oh. limbs um, and to throw away <clears throat> um, uh, instruments because he's become the instrument himself. Um, so I've seen I've seen treatments of him as a kind of going back to your question about the the. Um, uh, um, uh, I guess Andrew's question about the, the how modern the book seems that it, it ha has been read in relation to um, um, Star Trek and and modern sci-fi as well. That captain going off the outer space. 
Yeah, yeah. Wrath of Khan. Jeff, I think you're right that um, the kind of mechanical way that he thinks about the crew ultimately comes to characterize himself. I mean, I think what mechanism signals there is a lack of free will. I, I mean, that that's how I read it. And so when he's imagining that the men are cogs in the machine, they are men who can be instruments uh, to carry out his quest. But he is so compelled, obsessed, monomaniacal that there's a question of whether he has will as well, right? I mean, we think of him as willful, uh, and yet is he if he is uh, in the grips of this monomania? But it, yes, it, 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 the closer he gets to Moby Dick, he says, I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's, that's like, um, that, that I, I think of that as a kind of soothing thought for him, like uh, he, that he speaks of Pip's, his growing relationship with Pip as being too soothing to me. He, and, he, and he dismisses Pip because he is too, too soothing um, at, at, in, in those late stages, too, too likely to um, divert him from, from his course. But um, I am Fate's Lieutenant, seems to me he's looking for an excuse to continue. Um, but Peleg says that Ahab has his humanities. Mm -hmm. and at the end, is there anything left of that? I guess is the question. Mm -hmm. I often think that the emphasis on Ahab is misleading because he's he isn't fully human. Whereas Ishmael seems to me is the one who has to face the choice of whether he will follow Ahab or not. And after the quarter deck, he does. He says, my voice went up with the rest. I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. Um, this, by the way, is, an, is a, a point that I learned from Leo Marx, um, who felt that the book was about um, a, um, Ishmael's uh, ethical crisis. Um, and the later part of the book, his withdrawing from Ahab to um, uh, reaffirm his bond with Queequeg as, uh, as a better um, alternative for him. Um, and at that point, I think Ahab stops being um, believable. Um, he, he stops being a person who has humanities. I mean, so many of Melville's characters are not human. <laughs> um, Bartleby, um, um, Goneril, uh, they're, they're characters who seem to be, um, uh, what is it, stripped abstract is the term that, that um, mm. Melville uses in, I forget, uh, where that, that where that comes, but there's a way in which Ahab becomes a kind of test of Ishmael rather than a person in himself. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to jump in and say I have the unfortunate job of being timekeeper, and we have about five minutes left in this lovely, robust conversation. So um, just to keep everyone aware, of where we Ron has a question. Looks okay. like no. I was just going to weigh in on the the Ahab issue and I mean it's early on that he he tosses the pipe aside and that maybe foreshadows his relationship with Pip and that's not meant to be something soothing but I, I wonder now I'm really beginning to wonder if um he has his humanities or there is an expectation of humanity with him because when Starbuck confronts him th there is an expectation that that exchange will matter when he appeals to Ahab about wife and child there's an expectation and even the gams, it seems like it's a, a, a steady eroding of his humanities, but, but there seems to be something in there. And I'm not sure he would resonate the way he does if he was machine-like throughout. Um, he probably arrives there, but there's such a complexity and dimension there that I, I think probably why he stands as one of the great Shakespearean-like tragic heroes. Mm -hmm. hey, I, I agree with you, Ron, because... <laughs> It's always interesting to me how at the end of the book, you know, students, even though they know what uh, Ahab has done, um, they, they still don't hate him, you know, and they're always trying to figure that out. How come they don't hate him? And uh, how come they don't think of him like Hitler or Pol Pot or something? And uh, yeah, I think what you just said was very. It's interesting to think about how Melville wouldn't we wouldn't have this novel if if he as a writer wasn't able to employ Ahab's energy uh, to enthrall us as as readers 
And um, uh, yet one way of reading the mechanical is that ultimately uh, we're freed from we're freed from Ahab, that Ishmael can see the springs and motives of his own of his own engagement with Ahab and that uh, both the, the older Ishmael and the narrative itself survives the demise of um, of Ahab really twice uh, as plot in the novel and as retelling of the story. And the so the ability to get beyond Ahab, I think, uh, um, is uh, is something greater than the machine uh, uh, in in that sense. But uh, the power of Ahab is necessary to exalt the text itself, uh, and mm -hmm. without it, it would not be what it is. Andrew, did you have a point earlier? Uh, yes, I I was I, I I was just thinking that the that the crew being enthralled to Ahab is partly one of the one of the points to the whole to the whole kind of Ahab Ahab deal, uh, but also his his uh, mechanics. Uh, you know, he's he's always trying to you know get to the ineffable, get to the inscrutable, to kind of punch through the the pasteboard mask, uh, and yet uh, at the very end, he's still saying that uh, that that when he comes back after after the the second day that uh, you know he's you know he's lost his wooden leg and uh, you know it's good to kneel to it's 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 good to lean on somebody again um, and you know there's still you know quite a bit of humanity there but yet he still seems to be driven uh, by the by the kind of the 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 devilish tantalization of the gods <laughs> as I as I read at the end of chapter 110 B, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it it just seems to me that 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 you know throughout throughout the whole book there are the there's there there's the black and whites there's the there's the white Americans there's the there's the there's the black Africans there's the class structure you know it, everything is black and white even uh, even the 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 endless kind of single-minded happiness of Bummer and Bunger. Um, uh, it, 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 it just seems to me that, the, you know, you know, you know Melville is, is just giving this huge tapestry that, you know, life is just never really quite in the extremes that you think it would work best. Um, and actually, that's just life. And that's just the wonder of the book, actually. I think that's a lovely summary point to mm -hmm. end with, because I think it, it richly uh, connects with our current moment in so many ways, right? The ways in which we're negotiating the kind of tapestry of life. Um, this is, uh, for my part, is my first uh, Moby Dick Marathon at the museum. Uh, been a pleasure to be able to participate in this conversation. Um, I will let the scholars say their own thank you to the attendees, but from the museum, uh, a warm thank you for joining us here at this event. Uh, I hope you continue to enjoy the marathon um, for the rest of the weekend. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Naomi. Yes, thank, thank you. you. It's great, Naomi. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming here, and, and I hope to see you in, in the real gallery. Uh, next Jan next January, if not sooner. Th thanks for being here. It's great to share. Uh, this is a community we need. Thank you so much. <laughs>